and uh, they're going to tell you if if you have ever seen any of their books, the photos are just breathtaking. This one is no different. In fact, I really so totally uh, everyone I look at, I think, well, this is the best. No, this is the best. But there is no best. There's a lot of bests. So he's going to tell you about hike. Uh, sorry, walk of a lifetime and there's no one I know than these two experienced hikers that will and walkers too uh, that can tell you better what walks of a lifetime you should be paying attention to so without it further ado um, there you go Martha and Bob Nanny thank you Susan um, can everybody hear me okay well I think they're muted they're muted. They're, they're, well, they're muted, except two people aren't, Patricia and Gus, so mute. I'm going okay, to... and um, let's see, Susan, so you can hear us okay? Yes. Okay, great. Good, good, good. Well, if anything goes wrong with the slideshow, please uh, give us a shout, And um, but I think we've got the uh, technology worked out, and uh, here we go. So thanks for the introduction, Susan, and um, yes, Martha and I do want to talk about this uh, book that we've written. Um, we've written a few books about walking and hiking. Um, this, I think, is probably our favorite. <laughs> it's, uh, as we write in the introduction uh, to the book, it was really a labor of love. Um, two of our biggest passions are our national parks and walking and hiking. Um, so we were able to combine the two into this book and um, it was a pleasure to, uh, to work on. Um, it brought us to some parks that we haven't been in for a while and even a few new ones to us. And so um, it was um, a good excuse to, to get out and do this. So uh, let's see on the cover here, this is an image at the cover of the book and we're looking uh, into Rice Canyon. So I'm going to move on through, whoops, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, and um, mm -hmm. this one, all right? Mm -hmm. Don't work. We haven't, we can't see them yet. We haven't seen anything? No. Share, we need to do share screen. Yeah, and um, let's see, let's try it again. Now they're, now you're on. Okay. Oh, good, good, good. Apologies. Still on? <laughs> yes. Good. So as I was saying, um, this is a picture of Rice Canyon. No? Uh, we're having a little technology issues here. Uh, it worked fine before, didn't it? Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll get it. Back to me. Um, you're, it says we're screen sharing, but apparently we're not. Well, I, I we can see it, but what's happening is instead of the uh, changing views, okay, now try it because the views were all on the side. Yeah. Um, and that's not how they were before. No, well, we're really, it says we're screen sharing, it says we're playing. Every time I go to advance the slide, it kicks us out. Yeah. Sorry, everybody who's patiently waiting. Um, um, we're, yeah, we're looking. So let's close this down and let's, um, okay, we closed it and we'll, we'll bring it back up. <clears throat> yeah, start completely over. Can you see that? No. Nope. Well, I'll be darned. Um, play. How about, well, I get, it, it won't hold. It just, uh, it clicks right out of the um, screen share. Although it says we're screen sharing. Hmm. Instead of me, trying to do play through uh, Zoom, try it through your PowerPoint program. 
I mm -hmm. think that works better. You might not get kicked out. Okay, hang on. Well, I don't understand why it worked the um, other day. And it worked perfectly. I don't know what's going on. You can't see anything but us now, is that correct? No, we see the video or we see the screen. We see the screen and we see on the side all the slides yeah. that are going to come up. But the screen is small and has a uh, junk on it, doesn't it? I mean, it has... Um... The, the Walks of a Lifetime, the book cover is big on the screen. The little slides, which weren't there before, are small. So I wonder if you could click on it. Yeah, yeah, that came up. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, yeah the slides are smaller than they uh, should be, but anyway, I think we should probably Susan, we probably should go with what we got. I think so too. Good, good, good. Okay, so um, anyway, our book then is uh, it's divided into three parts. Um, part one is uh, fairly brief, and it really tries to ask the question: Why would we want to walk in the national parks? And I think that you know under other circumstances, Martha and I would want to linger on this slide for a while. <laughs> and talk about these two things, talk about the national parks and talk about uh, walking and hiking. And as Susan suggested, um, we, we do tend to use the word walk a lot um, instead of hike. Um, we don't really see any difference, to be perfectly honest, between walking and hiking, um, or where to draw the line between walking and hiking. But we, use the, we like the word walk because it uh, sounds less intimidating <laughs> than <laughs> hike, uh, at least to some people. And um, you know, our books really, uh, one of our major objectives is to try and encourage people to get out and walk more in their everyday lives and to um, walk in the national parks to be sure, because we think it's certainly the best way to um, appreciate them. Um, now, the national parks have been called America's best idea. I imagine most of you have heard that. Uh, Ken Burns did a wonderful documentary film a number of years ago called America's Best Ideas idea and it was all about the national parks. Um, he's quick to say that he didn't come up with that slogan. <laughs> um, it really is attributed to Wallace Stegner. Stegner was a writer and a conservationist in the 50s and 60s and 70s and um, he wrote that uh, the national parks are America's best idea and what he really meant by that is that the parks are a manifestation of American democracy. Um, here are these places that are important to all of us, um, and we should all own them in common. Um, and that was a very revolutionary idea. The, fir the first national park in the United States was Yellowstone in 1872. Actually, it's the first national park in the world. Now, that's not to say that other countries throughout history haven't created parks of some kind, but mostly they're accessible only to the rich and to the politically powerful. Um, this idea, our idea of a national park, what Yellowstone represented was the setting aside of a relatively large area of our country for the benefit of everyone. Um, and um, so that's a, a, a very important idea and uh, it should be, it should be an incentive for us to encourage people to go out and appreciate the national parks. I think I might have something to say about that a little later on. There, there are a lot of visits to the national parks, but there are some groups in society that aren't well represented. And we should worry about that because if the parks, that, that's the way, of course, to encourage um, everyone to visit the national parks. Uh, that's the way to really uh, achieve our goal of democracy. Um, and then uh, the second idea is uh, walking the talk. And we, we say that um, there are a lot of reasons that we should walk more in our everyday lives. Walking is really a part of what makes us human. Um, we're really the only animals like us that walk up on two feet. And um, the idea is that uh, by rising up on two feet, it freed our four limbs to become hand, arms and hands that made us tool makers and that expanded our brains um, and ultimately we evolved in the, in, into homo sapiens. Um, so to celebrate that evolutionary heritage, we should go out and take a walk every day. Um, and um, of course now um, we understand, uh, it's in the news everywhere, that walking is an important way to, um, to make yourself healthy, uh, to keep yourself healthy. Um, both physically and mentally. But to do that, we have to walk the talk. Um, we like to say in the book occasionally, 
um, that walking is simple, but it can be profound. It can really be filled with a lot of meaning. And particularly when it's applied to the national parks, we, uh, yeah. So we, we think that um, it's a way to appreciate the parks through all of our senses. Um, and for example, we can see the wonderful wildflowers at Mount Rainier in, in, in Washington, which may have the very best wildflowers in all the places. We can hear the canyon wren call as we walk the trails of the Canyon National Park. Um, we can smell the sweetness of the ponderosa pine bark warming in the sun in Yosemite, and we can do that right here in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, we can taste the salt air as we walk along the beach at Olympic National Park. It's 60 miles of wild Pacific Ocean beach. And finally, we can feel the parks. We can feel the solid granite beneath your feet as you explore our Royal National Park and, and many others. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I was going to say, we're going to go um, to uh, five of the national parks as representative sample. There are 62 um, national parks in the system, 62 with the name National Park. Um, and today for our um, potpourri of parks, we're going to go to Glacier, Channel Islands, Crater Lake, Yosemite, and Acadia, trying to give you an idea of the diversity of experiences you can have. Um, Glacier National Park is our first visit in northern Montana, directly adjacent to Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park. Um, it was an early park and it has over a million acres. And Glacier is a world heritage site, which means that it's been recognized by the international community as having uh, significance, global significance. The uh, prime mover, the European prime mover uh, behind getting the park to be established was George Bird Grinnell. Um, I have to point out that he was um, also a co-founder of the Audubon Society, <clears throat> which I love given his middle name. And um, Grinnell referred to a glacier's crown of the continent. It showed his uh, European uh, influence philosophy of looking at the landscape. Now the people who live there, the Blackfoot indigenous people referred to it as the backbone of the world. The area um, that became glacier was so central to their being that it was their backbone. And the Blackfeet Nation sold 800,000 of the million acres to the government. Uh, they were promised that they would always have subsistence rights and could use the park. But um, this was, um, this promise was broken to them. Um, the going to the Sun Road uh, that goes through Glacier National Park, it's a 50 mile long road that really showcases the park. And um, it's one of the world's most scenic drives. And you can see just from this one viewpoint off the uh, going to the Sun Road that the park really does celebra celebrate glaciation. Uh, about 10,000 years ago, when the last ice age came through, it carved those U-shaped valleys. It created the arrests and the, uh, the sharp points, cirques, uh, tarns, moraines, left erratics and polish and uh, all of these are showcased in Glacier National Park. And we're going to go on the Grinnell Glacier Trail, uh, which takes you up to Grinnell, Upper Grinnell, Great, Upper Grinnell Glacier Lake. And um, this, I have to say, I think is one of the most beautiful hikes in the entire National Park system. It's fairly long. It's 11 miles round trip and there are 1600 feet of elevation gain, but you don't need to be put off by that because you can go as far as you want and turn around. You will not be disappointed with a single step on this trail. It is really spectacular. Here we can see the bare grass um, growing along the side. We were there in late July. You start off uh, from one of the historic hotels um, in Glacier. These were built by the Great Northern Railway to try and bring tourists into the parks. That was a, a very different problem than the parks are now uh, experiencing, but they were trying to get people to come, so they had to build destinations for them. And um, this, this trail that we're going to go on will take us to one of the last remaining glaciers in the park. There used to be about 80 of them when the park was established in 1910, and right now there are about 30, excuse me, 25. There are 25 and they uh, estimate that they'll all be gone 
in a decade. So this is a time to uh, go out to the park to uh, celebrate the glaciers and maybe it's um, a wake up call to, call to think about uh, climate change. Um, as you walk along through this spectacular landscape, you go past three uh, large lakes that are turquoise from the uh, glacial till that colors them. And uh, the whole park has 700 miles of trail. And um, I think there are other spectacular ones, but this one is, I think, the best. Uh, we saw wildlife along the trail. We saw um, bighorn mountain sheep and we saw grizzly bear. And um, it was really exciting to uh, see these animals just out in nature. As I said, it was um, in late July that we were there. You can see the uh, snow field that we had to walk across. You can also see that this is not a difficult trail to go along. Um, the surface was really nice and smooth. It was just a very uh, pleasant, well, it was more than pleasant. It was a glorious day. And um, when you get to the end and you get to uh, Upper Grinnell Glacier Lake, um, you, you go across the final terminal moraine of the original glacier and there are remnants of the glacier left there. Um, the water is icy, icy cold. Um, there are this massive head wall and cascades and this close up view of the glacier and it's truly magnificent. Okay, now we're going to change pace and we're going to go to Channel Islands National Park, which may be a park that um, perhaps um, but um, hopefully you've been there. Um, this is a view of, of Anacapa Island. So the Channel Islands are a group of eight islands off the um, coast of Southern California. Five of the islands constitute the park. Uh, the others are privately owned. Um, it's a relatively recent park uh, established in 1980 and about a, about a quarter of a million acres. Um, it's nice. Hmm? That's not there now. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so um, Channel Islands is, it's mostly a preserve for wildlife, uh, bird life and sea mammals. Um, it, and for science, uh, a lot of research conducted here. Um, and um, it's certainly accessible to visitors but you won't find many of the facilities and services that you do in most other national parks. You're pretty much on your own. There are some maintained trails for sure, um, but um, it's a bit of an adventurous park. Um, it's often referred to as the Galapagos of North America. Uh, it's extremely biodiverse. It supports a lot of bird life and sea life. Um, and um, it's isolated from the mainland, um, maybe 50 miles off the coast. Um, and um, it used to, the islands used to be attached to the mainland of California. But of course, a long time ago, the ocean levels rose um, and the islands had been separated. Wildlife from the mainland, of course, lived on the islands, but when the, part, when the islands became separated from the mainland, um, they had to evolve to this new, much more limited habitat. What we see here is what's known as an island fox. So foxes, uh, this is much smaller than other foxes that you'll find in California. The, the, when they're full grown like this one is, um, they're just a little bit larger than a large house cat. Um, and there are many other examples of animals that lived on the islands and had to adapt. And I think my favorite one is um, mammoths. So mammoths did wander out onto the islands. And once they were isolated there, they too reduced in size to adapt to this new, much more limited habitat. And sometimes, of course, they're not there anymore, but sometimes they're referred to as pygmy mammoths, which I think is a great oxymoron. Um, so there's lots to see out of the islands. Um, we're on uh, Santa Cruz Island right now, but we're gonna jump to um, Anacapa Island in just a moment. Um, on both islands though, uh, lots of nice beaches to stroll, um, coves to explore. Um, Martha and I sat here, we hiked out to this cove and we sat here and had our lunch and were serenaded by the sea lions barking at us. 
And now we're at East Anacapa Island, which is um, one of the other five islands in the park. Um, there are actually five, excuse me, three Anacapa Islands. Um, this one is East Anacapa. It's the only one that's open to visitor use. The others are reserved exclusively for wildlife or, or for research projects. We can see up on the bluffs of the island, uh, the uh, lighthouse. That lighthouse was built in 1932, and it's the last permanent lighthouse that was built on the West Coast. Um, the Park Service also built, oh, excuse me, it wasn't a park at that time, but to service the lighthouse or to staff the lighthouse, um, there are a series of several Spanish Revival style buildings that were, still exist on the island. Getting to the island is a bit of an adventure. Um, so you have to take a ferry. Um, the ferry, most of the ferries depart from Ventura, which is about an hour, an hour and a half north of Los Angeles. Um, you can buy a ferry ticket and hop on. Um, and um, often rough seas, um, but here we are, you can see in the background, you can see some land where we're just getting ready to try and go ashore in this little harbor that services East Anacapa. Now what the, what the boat captain does is he backs the boat up to those pilings that you can see, and he keeps the motor running so the stern of the boat keeps um, nice and tight against those pilings, or at least that's the idea. And we get up on some ladders and we get up onto the dock. And then we go up this steel staircase um, to get up to the top of the island. And here we are. Um, so it's a wild place. Um, it's not managed particularly. Um, it's given over to vegetation and wildlife. Uh, we can see one of those abandoned Spanish style um, buildings that used to support the, uh, the operation of the lighthouse. Of course, all that's automated these days. Uh, if you like Western Gauls, you're going to like Anacapa Island. Um, it's the place where almost all Western Gauls uh, reproduce. Um, we can see the lighthouse again. There are limited trails on the island. It's not a big island, um, maybe just a few miles of trails. The ferry gets you out uh, to the island and then uh, departs and uh, passengers have maybe three hours or so to wander around the island. And we've had our three hours of hiking now um, and we're back on the ferry. We're saying goodbye to East Anacapa Island and Arch Rock. And uh, on the ride back to the mainland, we had a super pod of dolphins that were playing in the wake of, the isle of our boat. Um, it was a, a nice way to end our visit to Channel Islands. And now for a change of pace, let's go to Crater Lake National Park. Uh, Crater Lake was, um, is in Oregon and it was a fairly early park. And it's uh, a little on the smallish side at 183,000 acres. And um, originally there was a volcano here, a big one that was uh, about 12,000 feet high. And about 8,000 years ago, there were a series of eruptions uh, around the base of the cone. And the, uh, they estimate that the eruptions were 100 times the force of Mount St. Helens. And it collapsed the upper part of the uh, volcano down into the lower part and left a giant 4,000 foot caldera. And um, over time, the uh, water from uh, rain and somehow has filled half of the, filled the caldera halfway up. In other words, the water's 2,000 feet deep and then there's 2,000 feet more to you get to the rim of the, the crater. And a uh, little um, conical um, landform in the center is um, called Wizard Island, named after Wizard's Cap. Now this water that you see is some of the clearest and cleanest water in the world. And to give you an idea of the size of Crater Lake, if you haven't been there, there is a road that goes around the rim and it takes, uh, it's a 33 mile long road to go around the rim of the crater. Um, this really is a story of how the mighty volcano became one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. And it offers one of the most enchanting um, views in the whole national park system. And it's a real favorite with visitors. Now there is more to the park than just the, the crater itself. Um, there is hiking, there's about uh, 90 miles of trails and 33 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. 
and um, wonderful views. Really, it would be a wonderful landscape anywhere else, except there is that uh, lake that calls to people. And we're going to go out and we're going to go up um, Wizard Island to, to Wizard Island Summit. This is the uh, cinder cone that you saw rising out of the lake. And um, this trail takes about four and a half miles um, in total, though it's going to take you most of the day because you walk down about a mile from the rim to the water at Cleetwood Cove. That's the only place you can um, get to the water in the entire lake. And then you take uh, the boat ride across and then it's about a mile up to the top of the island, uh, gentle trail, I'll show you that. And um, then you can go down in slightly if you want and then you have to reverse your step. Um, Hi, Patty. This, this is the- oh, Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Can you, um, can you run me through, what did I put on there? Hmm. Identity yeah. procedure, persistent identity procedure. No, you're going to be in a group because you're going to do it with people in a group. So you just put your name there and they'll finish. And they'll, they'll contact you and tell you when the group's going to go. Okay. I've got, you know, another half hour and I've got two hours tomorrow morning, but I've been waiting. I went five hours for Hello? the last group. If yes. Can, can whoever's talking, can you hear me? Can you please mute yourself? We're trying to do a slide presentation. Okay, so uh, this is the kind of boat that you'll take to go out to Wizard Island, just a small open boat. Um, and then up the, the trail you go. See, it's, it is a very gentle trail. It's really fun because you're looking at this wonderful uh, crater all the time. And once you get to the top, not only do you see the rim of the crater in the distance, but you can look down into the center of the cone. And if you look in the other direction, you look out over where the lava and the cinders have spilled into the lake. Um, again, you go back by the boat um, to the uh, shore and back up from the Cleetwood Cove. And it, it really is a very um, unusual way to see Crater Lake. It's a chance to stand on the rim of a volcano that's within a volcano. And um, people, it, it, it's suitable for all ages and people just love it. Yeah, yeah. So now we're going to go to Yosemite and um, gosh, we had to put Yosemite in this slideshow because this park is really important to, to us. It's really where we sort of started our interest in the national parks. I was, uh, when I graduated from college and Martha and I were married, we, I was stationed uh, in, in the military uh, in California, in, the San, in San Francisco, um, and we started going to Yosemite National Park. And, I just didn't know that places like this existed. Um, and it really changed our lives in, in very important ways. And I, I knew by the time I had finished my obligation to the Coast Guard that I was, um, I wanted to do something with my life that related to national parks. Um, so Yosemite is an early park, uh, 1890. Remember Yellowstone was the first in 1872. And it's a fairly big park. I mean. It's not big by Alaska standards, but it's big for uh, the lower 48, about three quarters of a million acres. Um, and um, we're gonna do, go ahead, thanks. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So um, we, we need, of course, to talk about John Muir. So John Muir, I think most people would say is the father of the national park system, if there is such a thing. Um, he really was supportive of the national park idea and in particular advocated for Yosemite to be a park and you know, did that successfully and went on to support the national parks more generally. Um, uh, he's got a lot of great quotes. Muir was mm, just so powerful and eloquent. Um, he says here, uh, the mountains are calling and I must go. Um, I, that really resonates to me. I used to tell that to my dean at the University of Vermont many times, and uh, sometimes he actually let me go. Um, Muir, Muir had some very original thoughts about the human relationship to nature. He, he was a transcendentalist. He believed that um, nature was God's most pure creation. And to get close to God, you needed to get close to nature. Um, and so he inserted himself into nature throughout much of his adult life much of it in Yosemite National Park. 
And this is another historic photo. Um, Muir's on the right and uh, Teddy Roosevelt's on the left. Roosevelt was present at, at the time this picture was taken in 1903. They're camping at Glacier Point and Roosevelt was just reveling in the park. Um, I mean, he was oriented to the outdoors to begin with and he dismissed his secret service agents. He asked them to please go away and leave him, Roosevelt, with Muir for several days so they could talk about things. Um, and um, Muir really took advantage of that, uh, you know, really supporting Roosevelt's ideas of setting aside public lands. Um, and by the time Roosevelt uh, finished his presidency, he had set aside 230 million acres of public lands um, for, for national parks, for national forests, and for national for fish and wildlife refuges. The land he set aside uh, during his short presidency um, is really the core of much of the national park system today. Really remarkable. And of course, when we think about Yosemite, uh, most, of, most of us, including me, uh, immediately picture Yosemite Valley. The valley is, is enormously impressive. Um, it's a, this wonderful convergence of natural features, these almost sheer granite walls rising from the valley uh, as much as 5,000 feet, some of the highest waterfalls in the world, the beautiful Merced River snaking through the old growth forests of the valley bottom, um, it's a magical place. Um, you'll probably recognize El Capitan. It's famous in the climbing community, of course. Um, lots of waterfalls. This is Nevada Fall, a relatively easy hike from the valley. But we should recognize that um, Yosemite Valley is only seven square miles. That's about 1% of the whole park of Yosemite National Park. There's so much more to the park. Much of it, what we call the High Sierra, the High Sierra Mountains, the high mountains of the Sierra Nevadas. Um, here we're, um, we're looking at uh, Tenaya Lake and notice the glacial action on the mountains that we're looking at. Look how smoothly polished they are by the, uh, by the uh, glaciers that retreated again about 10,000 years ago. And we're gonna do a hike here that's very unusual, um, perhaps even unique. Um, there's something called the High Sierra Camps Loop. So it's all in the High Sierras. Um, there are a series of six High Sierra camps that have been set up. Um, here we see a, they're, they're semi-permanent tents. So the, the tents are taken down, the canvas is taken down, uh, each winter, but put back up again in the spring to become a place where you can stay. So there are six of these about a day's hike apart. Um, and so you can make this wonderful loop that's called the High Sierra Loop. Um, here we're, they're, they're not fancy. <laughs> they're just uh, six beds and a wood stove uh, in each of these cabins. Um, but if you want to do a, a, a multi-day hike, in the High Sierra and you're not prepared to backpack, the High Sierra camps loop are a really interesting alternative, very unusual in, uh, in, in America really. And um, not only is it a place to stay, a place to sleep out of the weather, um, but it's also, uh, they serve meals. <laughs> so they'll cook for you, they'll cook your breakfast and your dinner. And if you look closely here at the sign, we're going to have salmon tonight. I think that's wonderful. Now, the High Sierra camps are a little bit controversial. We probably would never do it today, but they started back in 1916, um, much like the, the hotel that we looked at at Glacier National Park. The National Park Service was looking for ways to attract people to the national parks. It wasn't easy to get to most of the national parks back then. Um, and so the, the Park Service uh, did a lot to try and encourage people to come. Um, and here we see a, a some mules and horses that are resupplying these uh, tent cabins on the High Sierra Loop. And there are just um, the High Sierra, I mean, the Sierras are my favorite mountains in the world. Um, they're so um, spectacular in many ways. Uh, we're walking out Lyle Canyon here along Lyle Creek. And the rivers, uh, 
rivers and lakes everywhere in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, this is, uh, we looked at the Merced River as it snaked through Yosemite Valley a moment ago. Here we're looking at the Tuolumne River that flow that drains the, uh, the other half of the park. And uh, let's I should say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I yeah. should say that the High Sierra Loops, um, High Sierra Loop is a, um, a six day walk, if you wish, um, and, um, but it's, it is expensive. Uh, so prepare yourself for that. And it's so popular um, that there's a lottery system uh, to be able to access the, uh, the high CR camps. I'm sorry, go ahead. No problem. Um, we don't want to forget about the East Coast. Um, here's another um, relatively early one in, the, uh, in May in Acadia National Park. Now, Acadia is a very small park by National Park standards of 49,000 acres, but um, it's, uh, it proves the old adage that big things come in small packages because this is one of the most visited and the most beloved national parks in the entire system. Um, originally the area was seen, the first European to see it was Samuel de Champlain in 1604. And he called it the uh, Island of the Barren Mountains. Um, it is uh, also shows glaciation. Here we uh, are on the highest mountain in the park, Cadillac Mountain, which is uh, the first place on the East Coast to get the sun for most of the year. Very popular spot for sunrise and sunset. And um, this was the first national park in the East. There are more national parks in the West because there was more uh, unused land in the West. Um, and then some of the um, spectacular landscape was Western but um, this is one that really should be on your list. It's an unusual park in that um, most of it was, uh, most of the land for this park was donated and most of the donated land came from John D. Rockefeller Jr. Here we're looking at one of the carriage roads. This is a unique feature that uh, Acadia boasts. These were um, a private highway system that uh, Rockefeller built when, uh, horseless carriages first appeared on the island. Matt, I should mention that um, Acadia is on a, a large, is primarily on a large um, island right off the coast of Maine, though there are, some of it is on some tiny little islands and a little bit is on the coast. Um, Rockefeller, as only the very wealthy could do, built 50 miles of carriage roads so that he and his friends could either ride on their horses or in their carriages uh, without these newfangled contraptions scaring the horses. And um, these are part of the park and have been preserved as a place for people to bike and to hike and portions are open uh, still for, for equestrian use. The granite boulders that line the uh, sides of the carriage paths are lovingly referred to as Rockefeller's teeth. Uh, and one of the favorite destinations for Rockefeller and his friends was Jordan Pond House. Now the original Jordan Pond House um, did burn down, but it has been replaced with a modern structure and they still serve the um, same recipe, popovers and homemade jam. And uh, there's really nothing better when you've been out hiking than popovers and homemade jam as you sit there and enjoy the glacial landscape. Now, another unusual thing about uh, Acadia National Park is that the local village improvement societies competed to build trails. And here we see an example of this. This is a lovely stonework trail, a uh, stonework step as part of the trail that must have taken a lot of hours and a lot of backbreaking labor to get in place. And there are examples of this because of this competition with the societies. Now the walk we're gonna do is the ocean path. This is really appropriate for all ages, uh, families love ocean path. And this is a two mile one way trail um, and it connects uh, popular features in uh, along the, the ocean shoreline. Now, if you look down at the bottom of the picture, you can see some of the, the trail. It's very smooth and um, easy to walk on. There is, it connects Sand Beach at one end. Uh, sand Beach is unusual because it's only the only natural sand beach on the whole island. And um, this island, by the way, is about 12 by 17 acres and roughly half of it is park and half of it is privately owned. Um, and the, the sand though, um, 
not unusual in the Caribbean, it is unusual on the Atlantic coast because it's formed with, from shell fragments. Um, as you walk along the um, ocean path, you um, get to see some of the most celebrated shoreline um, in Maine and um, the rocky undeveloped shoreline. You have direct access. You can leave the path at any time and go down over the rocks to a uh, wonderful tide pool exploration or sitting on the rocks. One day we came by and there were uh, there was a couple sitting there waiting for the sunset. They had their uh, lawn chairs up on the rocks and they had their beverages and they couldn't have looked any happier. We thought that's one way to enjoy the national parks we hadn't thought of. Um, you go past Thunder Hole, which is um, one of the most popular attractions in Acadia, which um, produces a loud booming noise when the surf is just right. And then you end up at Otter Cliff in the distance. So it's two miles one way. You can obviously turn around and go both ways. But Acadia has a wonderful uh, free public transportation system. And on the Island Explorer, and if you were to go to the end and get off at the appropriate stop, you could walk back and make it into a, a one-way hike. Um, this, um, I can't say, it's a small package, as I said before, but I can't say enough good things about Acadia. Great. So um, that's uh, part two of the book. So uh, part two, as I think we mentioned, um, you know, there's a chapter on each of the 62 national parks. Um, each chapter um, provides a description of the park um, and the, for the first half of the chapter, and then the second half is a uh, the five or six hikes that we recommend um, in each park. Um, our, our idea is that if, if readers do the five or six walks that we recommend and describe, then they'll come away from the park with a real sense of you know, why this park is important. And, and I have to say, we've done all these hikes. We feel, yeah. we feel very good about that because um, if you have any of other uh, books or if you uh, find a hike in this book and we describe it in a certain way, um, walks and uh, there are things in there that are uh, nature trails maybe a total of a half mile up to uh, multi-day trips so we try and offer diversity for yeah. different folks yeah and then we come to part three of the book which is uh, not long um, and it's uh, about how to visit and walk in the national parks we've over the years we've developed uh, 10 principles that we think um, that if you read and follow uh, these principles, you'll get a good idea of how to go about visiting the parks and doing the kinds of hiking hikes that we're talking about. Um, so uh, we encourage you to, to take a look at that. And is that it? So Susan, I think that brings us uh, to the end of our little show. And, um, you know, we'd be glad to talk about uh, doing some questions or answers or encourage pe encouraging people who are participating to tell us a little bit about their impressions of the national parks. People can unmute now. Uh, I have some questions while people are getting it together. There's none, none in the chat box that I can see so they can ask them in, in person. Um, but I just wondered if after all this time, you have a favorite national park oh, we, i know everyone asks that but yes that but and um to some extent the answer uh, varies depending on where we've been last or what superintendent we're talking to you know if the superintendent asks bob what's your favorite national park you can be sure he's going to reply oh this one is but and, and <laughs> this one the time. but um of the 62 i'd say uh, grand canyon is my favorite um, of course, it's a spectacular landscape and all that, but we lived there. Um, we lived there in the, uh, the a time in our lives. It was our first sabbatical away from the University of Vermont. And uh, we lived there for an entire year with our uh, elementary age children. They attended the school. It's one of the few national parks that has a school right in it. And um, we lived with the national park folks. Um, we learned all about them national park system by experiencing experiencing it and it was really wonderful to have the park so incredibly accessible so that might be my, mm -hmm. my all time. yeah it's hard to argue against grand canyon but i'm going to um and um, i think as i mentioned a 
at the beginning, um, Yosemite still is important to me. Um, I've just um, never seen a more beautiful place and, mm. and it turned out a more meaningful place. Um, yeah. We were very fortunate to be able to spend a year there with um, rubbing elbows with the National Park Service staff. Wow. It was, it was a good, good experience both personally and professionally. Did you get to meet the native people there? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, there are uh, a number of at a big park like Yosemite, uh, you know, there would be a number of staff who have um, have roots in this place. I mean, they started their interest at this park as well. Um, wow. Lots of, lot, although many people who work for the National Park Service, many of them move around quite a bit uh, from park to park. Um, there are others who decide on what park is really important to them, and you know, maybe that will work for them. Mm-hmm. Well, something else that people complain about is how crowded the parks are and how how can you avoid crowds I think was uh, 300 million people visiting during the year and is there any way you can find your way around have you found your way around that so that you're not there with <laughs> just wall wall people we, ha we have visited um, national parks at the height of their visitation um, you know Zion in, uh, on the 4th of July or <laughs> in the middle of the summer. And um, interestingly enough, you, you can have a good time, perhaps helped along by the fact that there are all these visitors. Now, this is something we address in a lot of principles um, that are, are principles at the end of the book, but um, some general ideas is think about the diversity that the national park system offers, and you might want to visit a less well-known park. Um, if you like um, features of thermal features, maybe instead of going to Yellowstone, you'd go to Lassen Volcanic National Park. Mm -hmm. or, you know, think about what it is you want to experience. And there's multiple parks that will fill that bill. Um, trying to go in the off season. I understand the off season is getting pushed out farther and farther as people uh, love the parks and go, but um, one of the most important things you can do is to uh, get out on the trails because the farther you get from the trailhead, the fewer people you're going to see. And um, so if you're, you know, if you, all you want to do is be in the parking lot of the visitor center, you're just going to feel crowded. But as soon as you get out and get away, um, you'll have some of the peace and quiet that you, you want. Um, use public transportation, um, go out earlier in the morning and then, um, maybe later in the afternoon. If you go out with an hour, between an hour of sunrise and an hour of sunset, you're most likely to see wildlife. And the light is just beautiful for uh, photography. And we've been in um, visitor centers and, you know, like let's say at 11 o'clock and here comes the father and the mother and the two children, you know, and um, they say, okay, I'm here now, what do I do? That's not the way to visit. You want to know what to do what you're going to see, you want to be as prepared as you can be um, when you arrive at the park. And that might even include um, buying your pass to get into the park ahead of time. You can do that online. Um, you can get the map ahead of time from the each national park. You can get a newspaper from those that publish them. Mm -hmm. You can get all this information. You can ask questions through their website. Every national park has their own website. So you can be ready to go and hit the ground running when you get there. And then another thing, you know, the people that are there are there for because they're like minded to you. They you know, they they want to celebrate in the parks. And if you can sort of adjust your attitude a little bit and say, isn't it wonderful that all these people are here wanting to share? That really helps a lot. Uh, I don't know. Did I leave something out that you add in? Or? No, I think that's right. Yes, I think a, a little attitude change is a good idea. Um, mm. and, uh, you know, we, that when people visit the parks and appreciate them, I think they become national park supporters. Um, and that's very important. Um, so lots of good, lots of good strategies. And I, I, I think they'll work for you. Yeah. Well, I thinking of another question. Um, I know Bob, you had written a book with some colleagues, um, a thinking person's guide to the national parks and um, and in that, you talk about some issues. What what are the biggest issues um, 
and primary concerns with the national park these days? Yeah, there are, there are a lot of them, Susan, unfortunately. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done to protect the parks. Um, I think that, um, so the National Park Service, we, we know that Yellowstone was the first national park in 1872, but Congress didn't get around to uh, creating the National Park Service until 1916. Um, and so when um, 2016 uh, rolled around recently, um, that was the centennial of the National Park Service. And so I did join with some colleagues to write this Thinking Person's Guide to America's National Parks. And it did talk about, uh, it, it talked about the idea that of course we need to celebrate the parks as we've been doing here uh, this afternoon, but we also need to do something to protect them. Um, you know, it seems like there's almost an obligation if you love something to do what you can to help protect it. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot to be, there's a lot of issues to, to be dealt with. I tend to think of them in sort of clusters of problems. One would be envir environmental or ecological issues. So the, the parks are, they're not always large enough um, to really protect the habitat and the animals that exist there. Um, and, and there's a lot of growth uh, around the edges of parks and all these things are really, um, they're making it more difficult to preserve the biodiversity of the parks. And of course, of all the environmental problems that, have, that affect the parks, certainly climate change um, has grown to be the most prominent one, uh, right. the most urgent and most prominent. Um, it's um, Martha talked about when uh, she was talking about Glacier National Park, the fact that um, you know, in, in 10 years or so, um, all the glaciers will have disappeared. Um, and that's the case, or those kinds of issues are the case at many parks. We have Saguaro National Park here in Arizona, of course. Um, it's gotten so hot and dry in Arizona that saguaros may not be sustainable in the park. The same thing is true with Joshua Tree National Park, mm -hmm. the namesake vegetation. So many uh, environmental problems to be dealt with. There are also a lot of social or cultural problems as well. Certainly we know that the population is growing. We know that many people are coming to the national parks than they used to. 330 million visits in 2000. Mm -hmm. one, on the one hand, it's a wonderful thing uh, that people are so interested in the parks. On the other hand, um, it, it's challenging to protect the parks um, with such demand for them. Um, and um, so that's an issue. I think that Yes, there were 330 million visits to the national parks, but as I mentioned at the beginning um, of today, there are some groups in society that are not well represented in the parks. African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanics, uh, many of these people are, are underrepresented. Um, and we need to do a better job of making the parks relevant um, to those groups, to tell the stories of those cultural groups as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I'd say the last sort of cluster of issues has to do with how we support the National Park Service, the agency that's supposed to be managing the parks. In 2016, I mentioned that that was the centennial of the National Park uh, Service. I wrote a couple of op-ed pieces in, in some newspapers about um, the National Park Service. Um, my title for the op-ed piece was Admired But Depressed the National Park Service turns 100. They just don't have the resources they need to protect the parks in the way that they should. Uh, the National Park Service receives less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the federal budget. I think we can do better than that. Um, the, uh, the number of employees in the National Park Service has shrunk to about 20,000. That's the same number of employees at Disney World. Um, again, I think we can do better than that. Um, the, the National Park Service has not been able to maintain the parks the way they should. They've accumulated a, a deficit of $12 billion of um, deferred maintenance. Um, so again, for all these reasons, National Parks deserve more support than we're getting. Well, that Along those lines, you recommend that people tr make a transition uh, away from being just park visitors 
to park stewards. Do you want to? Yeah, that's that's the that's, that out. That's principle number two. <laughs> the last principle um, in the third part of the book, or toward the end of the book. And um, our point is that um, you know if you appreciate the parks, then find some way to help steward them. Um, and there are lots of things that can be done. I mean, uh, you can volunteer to, uh, to help people at the visitor center answer questions as they come in and visit this, uh, the visitor center. You can, um, you can monitor sea turtle nests at some of the parks. You can help maintain trails. You can help organize historical archives. Um, you can write your Congress, uh, rep congressional representatives and ask them to support the parks more than uh, that is being done presently. Um, you can support nonprofit groups that are, that are trying to help the parks, the National Park Foundation, uh, the Yosemite Fund, the Friends of Acadia. Um, nearly all the parks have friends groups uh, that help raise money uh, to protect the parks and to manage them. And then lastly, I'd say, um, be an informed voter. You know, uh, try and dig in a little bit and find out if somebody's running for Congress or the Senate or president or whatever, um, how do they feel about national parks? Um, are they gonna promise to support them? Um, and if so, um, you know, cast your vote or at least consider casting your vote in that direction. Yeah, those are good, good uh, ideas. Well, the only thing I think I can think of is um, I know you have hiked every single trail that you have written about, both of you. And I wonder, especially Martha, do you have, do you have any time you remember that you might have found yourself in danger in one of those beautiful trails? Um, I, I really can say, in all honesty, no. Um, that um, when we go, we try and when we go to the visit the national parks, we try and educate ourselves ahead of time as to you know what the current weather conditions are, so that we have the clothing with us that means that if we go to the top of Wheeler Peak and Great Basin National Park in Nevada, that we're not going to freeze because we we do have the right clothing on. Um, we um, we found that people, other people, um, are so much more friendly in national parks. I mean, you go to the Lamar Valley and Yellowstone and there are people with these, you know, uber fancy spotting scopes and they call you over, you want to look through this, you know, put down your binoculars, look at, look through my scope. I mean, people, um, I've used the term like-minded before, people are very um, sharing and, and friendly and uh, you'll walk along a trail and they'll say, you know, look around the corner, you'll see this, that, and the other when you meet. It's, that's all really good. And we know about the animals. I mean, we've encountered alligators and grizzly bears and bison, and we know what to do when we encounter them. Uh, we were in uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, summer before last, uh, came around a blind corner and there was a bison coming the other way, very close on the trail. And, you know, we just got out of that bison's way. I won't say that I didn't feel an adrenaline surge, but there was no issue, no conflict because, you know, we respected the animals and knew what to do. So um, I feel probably safer in the national parks than I do most other places. Uh, it's, it's always been a good experience. So. Good. Have you been lucky? I've, I've had people tell me when they ran into a mother moose and a baby that that that, that was the scariest thing they ever had happened to them but you probably know better than to hike at the wrong times too or walk can you say there's no difference no there's no difference yeah <laughs> use yeah. whatever you like well it depends on who you're talking to you know yeah. someone who um you know climbs mountains and, you know, is an endurance athlete or whatever, you know, their idea of a walk would, might be our idea of a, you know, so it's just <laughs> a continuum. And where are I, you on continuum? I would say, though, just the person that it does feel, it feels so much better when you say walk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hike does sound like it might be a little more work. Uh, walk, you can stop and smell the flowers, which you can do on a hike anyway, but but just just the <laughs> the connotations. <laughs>
Does anyone else have any uh, more questions? Um, if if so, unmute yourself and ask them before before we're gone. Just a quick statement. I found when we went to Arches and Canyonlands at the beginning of November, uh, it was all Americans who were there. There were no foreign tourists. Like when we go to the parks often, there are many foreign tourists and they love coming to American national parks. Uh, Grand Canyon as well, it often has more foreign tourists than it does Americans. Uh, and because of the current COVID situation, it's Americans who are getting out and seeing the national parks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's an interesting observation. Right. I think uh, when you're on the, the rim trail of Grand Canyon, uh, you hear a lot of languages that change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's, a, that's the way it is. That's the way it is, and maybe it's, it should be. I mean, Grand and Canyon. it's wonderful. I mean, it, people from other countries just love seeing our parks. They are so envious of our national parks. Yeah. I mean, they don't have mm -mm. like this sort of a celebration of culture that we mm -hmm. have. And it's, it's really interesting to talk to some of them, you know, um, where they want to go, where they, uh, you know, it puts some Americans to shame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if any, anyone else before we go? It just, it, this, if you, I will say, if you don't have the book, um, be sure you get it. It just, it just makes you, well, it makes me feel like I am, I, that's somewhere I better be like next week. The, the photos are so alive. They're wonderful. And, uh, La Patricia Watkins says, thanks for sharing. Yosemite's on her list for 2021. And that's such an amazing place too. I mean, that's one of my favorites too. We're going there again for 2021. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hopefully, thank you. There'll be no fires there. We tried to go in October and the fires were, Yeah, they had to close the park. Yeah. It's very, very scary. My uh, niece is a, uh, a park preserve person and she, uh, it, it, it was a terribly worrisome time. So I'm, I'm glad it didn't um, do what it might have done. But uh, those fires, we won't even go there. So anyway, anybody else? Well, thank you so much, Bob and Martha. You guys, you always give such an interesting presentation. I, I, I always seem to think, I mean, the books are amazing, but even after the book, you fill in things that I never would have known. And I'm just very impressed and wanting to put on my hiking boots. Well, thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Peregrine's uh, support for carrying the books and uh, well, and for everybody showing up on a very beautiful day. Yep. Yes, well, we're all honored, and don't forget, folks, we'll have books in by mid to the end of the week. More books, um, you know, and I have a feeling people are going to buy them, keep buying them three or four at a time. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, and uh, thank you, audience. You've been great. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. We'll wait for your next book, Bob and Martha. Bye. Bye.